you were having. Welcome this morning. Appreciate you being here with us as we're, we're wrapping up this study of first, uh, excuse me, Second Peter. Although you'll notice, wait a minute, we're not talking about Second Peter. I'll explain that in just a second. Although if you've been here, you know we have finished the text of Second Peter. But I'll explain what this class is here in just a second. Before we begin, uh, let's have an opening prayer. I forgot to call on someone. Mr. Mike, could I, could I call on you to do our opening prayer this morning? Pardon me for not getting you beforehand. I forgot. Let us pray. Kind of wish to the Father, Father, God, we praise God and glorify your holy name. Give us this wonderful opportunity to send in ourselves as friends, as family, as loved ones, Father. Father God, we pray that you would be with us this morning, Father. Help them to deliver the word that you have placed on this heart and in this schedule, Father. And we pray that you would be with us and that we may take in each word that you said that we know this word is from you. And use it in our everyday lives, Father, that we may bring someone to you or even none of our lives. Father God, in my son, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Biden. So as I mentioned, we have finished our study of 2 Peter, and we have two classes left. And my original plan was I had some, if you were using your book, I had some lessons at the end. We were, we were going to look at some themes of 2 Peter, some broad themes. But because we really had talked about those throughout the, the, the quarter, and because I was kind of ready to talk about something new, and I'm sure probably some of you are too, because it's the second quarter you've been sitting here listening to me talk about first, first Peter and then now Second Peter. I wanted to address this because in 2 Peter 3, verse 13, Peter says explicitly, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Which raises the question, what exactly is Peter talking about there? What is the Christian hope that he is referring to and so it brings up all these questions about creation and the land. If we were going to put it in words coming from Jewish, uh, Peter's Jewish background, what is the role of the land or God's material world that he's made? What is the role of that in the biblical worldview? And so I want to take our last two classes to discuss this because throughout this quarter in, in 2 Peter, you've heard me mention the new heavens and the new earth. You've heard me allude to what I think Peter's referring to, but I haven't gotten to really flesh out the, how Peter's statement fits into the entire biblical story and why I have certain views on that that I have. And so what I want to do in this class and the next is talk about this subject and try to give you what I think the Bible is teaching about God's role or the role of, of God's material world in the worldview of these scriptures that we're given. Now, before we get into the actual content, there's two introductory points that I want to make. The first one being, why is this important? Why, why should we take the time to try to accurately understand the role of the land in the biblical worldview? And so there's three reasons I'd give to you. The first one is biblical accuracy. Kind of tying in with what Rex talked about this morning. If we're going to be people who claim we love the truth, we love the truths of Scripture, well, then we should always care about being accurate in what the Bible is actually saying about whatever subject is under examination. And so that's the first reason that this is important, just to be accurate with what the hope is and what the biblical story is. A second reason why this is important has to do with God versus Satan. It's just how I've summarized it. I'm not implying by that that God and Satan are equal beings and that there's a struggle there. But I'm just what I mean by that is that this topic and how we understand it has a bearing on how we view God's response to what Satan has done to the material world that God has made. Now, I'm going to flesh this one out in the next class. Because I want us to have seen passages in both the Old and the New Testament before I, I delve into why, what am I getting at here? What bearing does this have on God's response to Satan? I promise I'll return to that in the next class because I think it will make more sense if I've had some time to uh, build a foundation before I develop that further. And then a third reason why I think this is important is because of our responsibility to creation. This, this topic and what we understand about it has a bearing on what our responsibility is to this material world that God has made. And we don't have time to go here, but as a parallel, and, and just something you can write down and, uh, and, and look at this for yourself, a parallel concept to what I'm getting at here is in 1 Corinthians 6, 
verses 12 through 20. Because I want, a lot of the things we're going to talk about about the land is parallel to other ideas that are expressed in the Bible. And in that passage in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 20, Paul is telling the Corinthians, you are committing sexual sin with temple prostitutes, and that is having an effect on your bodies. You may recall that passage where Paul says every other sin is outside the body, but sexual sin is a sin against the body. Why is that such a big deal to Paul about sins against the body? Well, he makes it clear in that passage. Your body is going to be resurrected. It's been redeemed for the purpose of resurrection. And so when you commit sexual sin, you are impeding God's resurrection purposes for the material body of yours that he means to reclaim for himself. It's the same thing we're going to see here. Well, let me back up. So what that means is we have a responsibility for what we do in our bodies. In that passage, Paul is specifically saying sexual sin. But think about how that point would be undermined if, as some Christians believe, well, our bodies are just going to get scrapped. It's just our immaterial souls that go to heaven. Our bodies are going to get destroyed, and they aren't redeemed. Well, then it's a lot harder to understand the force of Paul's point in that passage. Because if your body is ultimately going to be destroyed, and it isn't going to be redeemed from the effects of sin, then it's hard to understand why Paul's making the point he's making in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, about the fact that your body is going to be resurrected, and so don't sin against the body with these sexual sins. It's the same thing with our responsibility to creation. If this creation is truly going to be abandoned to destruction, then it's very hard to put any weight on us having any responsibility to this material world. It's difficult to do that. But if this creation, like our bodies, is going to be redeemed by God, then like our bodies, what we're doing in creation now matters. Just like what Paul's point is in 1 Corinthians 6. That's another reason why this is important. Now there's one more introductory point here I want to make before we get into this topic. These are three reasons, among others, why this, I think this is important. But we also need to discuss very quickly why this is a difficult subject to discuss. There are some challenges that come about when this topic is brought up and discussed, especially among Christians within our circles, in Churches of Christ. And so what I want to do is kind of like removing rocks before you till the ground. Let's bring to the surface some of these challenges so we can kind of set them aside so they don't impede a thoughtful consideration of the things that I'm going to be presenting today from Scripture. The first reason why this is difficult is it's quote-unquote newness. And the reason I put that in quotes is because it's not that this is new, as in this, this view has never been believed before in the history of the church. It's that it's new subjectively, experientially for a lot of Christians. And, and as you know, you probably experienced this, when somebody says, hey, this is what the Bible teaches, and you've never really heard that before, isn't it human nature to immediately kind of resist? Like, well, I can't be right. Because if that's true, why has my preacher never said that? Why have my parents never told me that? Why have the elders never said that? And so the newness of it makes us kind of resist it as if newness is somehow experiential, subjective newness is somehow a statement on the veracity of the claim. And it's not. We need to remember that just because something might be new to us subjectively doesn't bear on whether the claim is truthful that we're hearing or whether the concept is truthful. The truthfulness of this has to do, plain and simple, what Rex talked about today, is this accurately interpreting the scriptures, the word of God? Now, of course, I would argue that it is, but I'm presenting it to you to judge it on that grounds rather than the grounds of, well, I've never heard it before, and so therefore it's probably not correct because that is not a determiner of truth. And then a second reason why this is difficult is its terminology. The terminology that we use to discuss this can be very, very difficult. For example, if I said this, if I had this statement and I said this, God's Israel will dwell in the land with God in the new age. Well, there's a whole lot of ways someone could interpret that statement. What do I mean by God's Israel? You need to unpack that first. What do, we, what do you mean by that? And then what do I mean by the land? You've got to unpack that too. I might mean one thing about it, a Christian Zionist would read that and take it a whole different way. Same words, but a whole different meaning to, to a Christian Zionist, for example. 
And also we run into this issue too, which we're going to look at today, this, these terminologies of physical and spiritual. So, oh, well, that's spiritual. And, and what Christians usually mean by that, at least in my experience, is immaterial. And so one of the things that we have to be clear on today, we're going to look at this uh, today, is that physical and spiritual in biblical terminology are not synonymous with material and immaterial. And so you'll recall, for example, in 1 Corinthians, well, go to 1 Corinthians 10. Let me just point this out, only because this is such an important point that throws people off. I remember another church I was at when I started talking about this. This was one of the issues for somebody who they, they just couldn't, they kept thinking spiritual means immaterial. And so if something is therefore spiritual, then it can't have a referent in this material world. It's got to be some immaterial thing. But let me just show you how that's not accurate. So go to 1 Corinthians 10. So in 1 Corinthians 10, just look at the first few verses with me. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Let me just stop there. What spiritual food is Paul referring to there, referring to the Hebrew wanderings? How did God feed Israel in the wilderness? Manna. Manna. Now Paul says that spiritual food and spiritual drink, what's the drink he's referring to there? Water. Now that water was provided by Christ. It was pointing to Christ. What God was doing there with Israel was pointing towards what he was going to do with his people. But notice that the food and drink that Paul says is spiritual was material. Manna was something you could actually eat. What Paul means by spiritual is that it didn't have its origin in this natural realm. Its origin was from the spiritual realm, but it was still material substance. That they could eat. It's the same point Paul makes a few chapters later in 1 Corinthians when he talks about Christ's resurrected body as a spiritual body. He doesn't mean an immaterial body. You'll recall that after Jesus was resurrected, Luke's gospel points out that he eats with his disciples to show them, I'm not a spirit. I am a material body. But it is a spiritual body in the sense that its origin was not of this earth. Christ's resurrected body was not born of natural means. Its origin was of the spiritual realm. And so it is a spiritual body, not a material body, but of a spiritual body in the sense that its origin was not from this natural realm. Now, we can come back to that as we're going through it, but that's just an example of how terminology makes this subject very difficult to discuss. Because people are going to be using terms and you have to unpack what exactly does that person mean by that term. I will try to be very clear, and that's why you'll hear me keep saying material and immaterial. And I mean that differently from physical and spiritual. And you'll hear that distinction throughout, especially when we get to some of the passages in the prophets today. And then just two more why I think this is difficult. And then I'll just stop and see what thoughts or questions you have before we get into the verses. Another reason that this subject is, dif is difficult to, to discuss is because it has a bearing, especially in our history, for how it plays into our differentiation from other groups. And so in the past, especially in our history of Churches of Christ, and some of you may remember this from the 50s uh, and, and earlier around that time period, where there was a big, big argument, you could say, on premillennialism. And how premillennialism, okay, well, though that view is that Christ is literally going to come back on this earth, there's going to be a literal thousand-year kingdom, and so that's a physical kingdom of Christ, and that's wrong. What's right is we believe in a spiritual kingdom. And again, you get into that terminology issue. There. Well, wait, what do you mean by spiritual? There. And also Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, I referred to that Truth magazine in the uh, last, I think it was last class. Several of the authors did this, where they tried to uh, I would say, bias new creation theology by saying, well, that's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And we don't want to be like Jehovah's Witnesses. We're not them. 
And so what makes this difficult to discuss is that sometimes we've had a more reactionary view to some of these concepts than a nuanced and thoughtful examination of, okay, well, is that what Scripture teaches? And if some other groups with whom we say, okay, wait a minute, they're wrong on some things, if they happen to have gotten it right on a few other things, we need to be willing to, say, to accept that. All right, well, on that one, yeah, we sure, we can agree. I'm not saying that everything Jehovah's Witnesses believe on this issue is the same as what I'm going to be presenting. I'm not saying that. There's going to be some differences there. But there's also some things where I would say, okay, on that point, Jehovah's Witnesses, I think, are correct. I think are on that point. And we need to be okay with that. It's all right. Some groups, they got some things right on some things. And then finally, what makes this difficult is the New Testament's apparent silence on this issue, on this subject. Apparent silence. The New Testament is not silent on this. But it is subtle, I guess you could say. Where clearly when you read the New Testament, the Old Covenant promises about the land go through a transformation. And it's easy to miss that transformation when we're not reading the New Testament scriptures in light of their Hebrew background. It's easy to miss the transformation that the New Testament authors are pointing out. And so the New Testament's apparent silence makes it difficult. So with all these things before us, all these difficulties, so it's like a minefield. You have to be very careful walking through. I've now taken the ambitious task and after a sermon where Rex talks about rightly dividing the word, you know, I was like, oh, great. He's talking about that right when I'm about to do this lesson here. I've now ambitiously decided I'm going to try to tackle this in two classes, even though there's way bigger. So the passages we're going to look at, we can't be exhaustive. I'm just, I've picked some that I think are representative to help us address this question of worldview. Oh, well, before I do this, hang on. Uh, let me stop here. What questions or thoughts do you have? on why this is important and why this is difficult before we launch into the material itself. Here, let me just stop here. What questions or thoughts do you have on anything I've said so far, if anything? Yeah, Claire? I'm interested to, to go through this, these, these classes for sure. I think, I think why it's important is, is that we need to have a better and as clear understanding as we can of, of what heaven means and yeah. You know, is it is it here? You know, is it here on the earth? Is it, you know, where, where is it? You know, is it up in the sky? I don't know. But uh, you know, I personally, um, you know, I've been reading a book called Heaven by Henry Green Alcorn. Okay. I'm not sure if I believe everything he says, but but you know, it, it's it's definitely a topic I think that will help us get more real yeah. about why we're doing what we're doing. Here. Yeah, and I, I think let me, a couple things what Claire said. First of all, let me, I'll be clear about this in the outset. I'm not claiming, I don't think the Bible is saying that um, our concept of heaven, that we, would, that we should say, well, heaven will be here. I, I would say maybe that's an oversimplification of it. Uh, I, I think a better way to conceptualize it is what Jesus says in what's called the Lord's Prayer. When he says, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Where heaven, the spiritual realm, where God's kingship is fully manifested, we want that and the natural realm that he's made to be one, which is what I think that the biblical scriptures are getting at. It. It's a more, uh, it's a fuller, more nuanced idea there. So I want to just be clear about that, lest anyone think that's what I'm going to be saying here. But also something else Claire said too, obviously I think what I'm going to be teaching here is correct, but I don't want to teach it in the framework of, um, kind of like what Claire said, you know, we, we want to have a better understanding I do think this is a better understanding, but I, I don't want to come across as, you know, let me educate you all on a better understanding of scriptures. I'm just humbly presenting it to you as here's what I think the scriptures teach. Give it a hearing and see if what I'm saying from the scriptures here is, uh, is making sense to you and whether it more accurately interprets the things that biblical authors are saying and the biblical worldview as a whole, which is what is so important. Ms. Margaret, was your hand up? Thank you. 
fire. So those are questions that pop my mind. I'm very interested in hearing more. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, not every question will be able to be answered. It's kind of like even the resurrection. Even if we say, I think accurately, yeah, there's going to be a bodily resurrection. Christ was the first fruits. He was materially resurrected. You could touch him. He ate food. That is the first fruits of what God is going to do. But even so, we still have questions about, well, how's that going to work? Like, who, what about those who died as babies? How are they resurrected? We still have questions about it, but we can still affirm the truth even while still admitting, okay, we, there's some questions about details that the Bible just doesn't answer. But at least we have the broad idea that we can affirm as truth. And it's the same thing with this one as well, with new creation. There's going to be questions I have about it, you have about it, but we can still affirm the broad truth of what the biblical story is saying. So here's how I'd like to approach this subject. In this class, we're going to answer this question. What is the worldview of the Hebrew scriptures regarding the land? I'm using land there just to refer to the material world of, that God has made. And I think we need to start here for two reasons. The first being, if we're going to understand the biblical worldview, well, then the natural starting point is the beginning. Go to the oldest scriptures and work your way through chronologically to see how that worldview is developed by the biblical authors. And then the second reason we need to start here is because if we were to jump right into the New Testament without an accurate knowledge of the passages to which those New Testament authors are referring and the Hebrew background that they were nourished in and developed in, then it's inevitable we're going to easily misunderstand some of the things that they're saying. And so we need to start here with the Hebrew scriptures. And so the first thing we need to do is understand the role of the land in the biblical worldview by going to the beginning. So go to Genesis 1. We're not going to read this whole passage here, but I want to point some things out from the passages we're going to look at. So go to Genesis 1. And really it's going to be 1 and 2. I'll just kind of refer your attention to some passages here throughout. Now I know we're familiar with these verses, these two chapters. But notice what God deems good. Here, so at the end of chapter 1, in uh, verse 31, it says, And God saw everything He had made, and behold, it was very good. Well, think about what that's saying here. Everything God had made, so that includes the entire material cosmos that He's made, the creation of male and female to be his image bearers in creation. They would be the material representatives of Yahweh himself in the world. And they would rule creation in his name. They would have dominion over creation in his name. But notice also in verses 29 to 31 of chapter 1. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. I'll just stop there. And then also flip over to chapter 2. And look at a few verses in chapter 2. Look at verse 5 of chapter 2. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For Yahweh God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. Now, also skip down to verse uh, 8 through 9 of chapter 2. And Yahweh God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, Yahweh God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then look at verses 15 and 16, and then I'll tell you why I, what I'm drawing from these passages. Verses 15 and 16 of chapter 2. Yahweh God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And Yahweh God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Notice that part of what God deems good is an inextricable connection between human beings and the material world he has made for them to live in. Man works the ground, 
And the ground then produces food to give life to the man. That's part of God's design. Again, man works the ground. The ground provides food for life for the man. And that is something that God willed. He created it that way on purpose. And he deemed it good. It's a symbiosis. It's a symbiotic relationship between man and the land. Now, why isn't the land, you know, in in this passage, like, wow, that sounds beautiful, that sounds great. Why aren't things like that anymore in the biblical worldview? Well, you know the answer to that, but go to Genesis 3. Go to Genesis 3. Now, notice what happens here in Genesis 3. After After the sin of Adam and Eve, notice what God says in verses 17 to 19 of chapter 3. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now notice in this passage that part of the curse, part of the effect of sin, and not a passive effect, it's a curse from God that he subjects creation to this, is that the relationship between mankind and the land is marred. Land will no longer produce food for the man and woman as easily as it did before. It's going to be harder to exist in this material world than it was before. Because of sin and the curse that God has put on the land. Now the question then is, what's God going to do about that? So this is what the Hebrew scriptures establish at the beginning. What God made is good. This was his intention. It's good. In fact, something I forgot to point out in Genesis chapter 3 at the beginning where it says God was walking in the garden. So notice that something else that was good about the created order before sin was that God made the material world, and then whatever this looked like, he walked in it. That's what Moses is wanting the people of Israel to understand. God was here. He made this as a place where he could dwell with his people. And if that sounds familiar, we're going to get to that in just a second. So once sin happens, it's affected. Creation is affected. What's God going to do about that? The question for us is, okay, is God's plan... To abandon, then, the material world he's made to the effects of sin. Or is he going to redeem it? Well, skipping forward in the story for how how the Hebrew scriptures answer this question. What is God going to do about this? That brings us then to the Exodus. So part of what God's going to do is he says, I'm going to take this man Abraham and his offspring are going to be the means by which my blessing returns to creation. It's going to come through this man's seed. The problem is this man's seed was enslaved. So how's God going to accomplish those purposes with this people if they're enslaved to a pagan power? Well, it's the Exodus. And notice in the Exodus what God's purpose is. Go to this passage with me. Leviticus 26. Go over to Leviticus 26. And again, all this is establishing a worldview here. It's the Hebrew Scripture's answer to why does this creation exist? Why is it the way it is? And what's God going to do about it? So look at Leviticus 26. And let's read verses 3 through 12. And listen for the language of Genesis here in these passages. If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you your reins in their season. And the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest, and the grape harvest shall last to the time for sowing. And you shall eat your bread to the full, and dwell in your land securely. I will give you peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. You shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand. 
and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat old store long kept and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you and I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. And I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. Now a couple points to notice here in this passage. Notice that when God brings Israel out of Egypt to be his solution for the problems of sin in creation, to be the means by which he will return his blessing to earth. Notice that that includes a restoration of the land. That he would bring them to Canaan, and Canaan would now be a new Eden. In fact, you may have noticed in this passage the language of Genesis. You will be fruitful and multiply. The land will produce easily for you. Well, what's that a reverse of? It's the reverse of what we saw in Genesis 3. It's a restoration of the land. And notice here that God says he will walk among his people. Again, restoring that, that sense of fellowship that existed when God was dwelling in this creation with his creation of man in the beginning. Now, in other words, what this passage shows us, at least thus far, is that God's plan is to cleanse a people and a portion of land from the effects of sin so that they may be, that they may restore his creation intentions. That's what he's trying to restore here. Now, the problem is we know what happens with Israel. Israel chooses, we don't want to be your special holy people. We'd rather be like the nations around us and go after idols and all those things, which eventually leads to their exile. And there's a parallel there as, as Adam and Eve are ex exiled east. So Israel is exiled out of God's presence of Canaan to the east. There's a purposeful parallel there. Again, biblical story here that the Bible is telling. And so the story of Adam and Eve is simply repeated in the story of Israel. Israel chose instead to go after what their eyes desired and to make themselves their own moral authority. And so because of that, they're exiled. So then we're back to the same question. Well, what's God going to do about all this? Maybe now is the point where God is going to say, all right, I'm done with this whole material world and trying to, to bring back my creation intentions. Now I'm going to do something different. Is that what the rest of the Hebrew scriptures claim? Well, no. This brings us to the prophets. When the prophets were now talking about the new age that is going to come, where God's kingship is going to be fully manifested over creation, and he will see his plans through to fruition. And so, for example, go to Amos. Let's look at what Amos says when he's describing this new age that God's going to bring about. Go to Amos chapter 9, the end of the book. Amos chapter 9. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There is a table of contents in your Bible, should these not be familiar books to you. And I, I will say this. Uh, this. This is just my feeling about it. I, I, I would, uh, my hypothesis is that one reason why I for certain and maybe some others have not held this view in the past. Is at least, okay, I'll just speak for myself. For me, it was because of an ignorance of the prophets. It was when I started studying the prophets and then seeing how the New Testament authors are taking those prophetic books and using them. That's one explanation for why my view on this shifted. Why I started to change my mind about what the real story of the Bible is. So look at Amos 9. Let's look at verses 11 to 15. In that day, 
the day of the new age, when God's kingship is going to be fully manifested. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares Yahweh who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the, tra the treader of grapes who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities that inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says Yahweh your God. Now in this passage, notice that in the age of restoration that God promises he's going to bring about, it's going to include a rebuilding of the Davidic dynasty. That's in verses 11 and 12. And it's also going to include the restoration of the fortunes of his chosen people. Verse 14. They're, they're, they will no longer be a, a subjected people, in other words. But notice that it is, this is inextricably linked to a restoration of the land in verses 13 through 15. Which shouldn't surprise us because we've seen that connection now from the beginning of the Hebrew scriptures to the Exodus, now to the prophets. There's this connection. The effect of man's sin had an effect on creation and God is intending to deal with all of that. Not just a part of it, all of it. He's going to restore and redeem. Now somebody could say, somebody might even be thinking, and someone said this to me in a class at another church. But Nathan, aren't these prophetic promises spiritual? And here's where we get into the terminology issue. I said, Mr. Kramer, what do you mean by spiritual? Do you mean immaterial? Which is what he meant. I said, okay, well now we've got to back up. Because that's not what spiritual means in the New Testament. It doesn't mean immaterial like we saw in 1 Corinthians 10. So if you mean by that, Aren't these promises going to be brought about by the spiritual realm? I'd say, well, yeah, yes. But God still has an intention of doing something in this material world. I'll give you an example from this very passage. When Amos says, or I should say, when God says through Amos in verses 11 and 12, I'm going to restore the booth of David and repair its breaches. He is metaphorically describing the Davidic dynasty as a building. We, get, we can understand that. That's a metaphor. But does that metaphor have a reference to something God did in this material world? Yes. Yes. Jesus is the literal son of David from the Davidic dynasty, and he is the eternal Davidic king to whom we kneel. We kneel before a Jewish Hebrew king. The son of David. God did that in the material world. The material line of David is restored. Now, there's a quote-unquote spiritual element to that. In that, how Jesus came about in his resurrection, the origins of that are from the spiritual realm, sure. But it's a material restoration of the Davidic line. Well, it's the same thing here in the land. God has an intention of doing something to his material world that has been affected by sin, just like the Davidic dynasty was destroyed, or I should say not destroyed, it, it was marred by sin. But what did God do with the Davidic dynasty? He restored it. I'm going to redeem it. Sin will not conquer the Davidic line because I said it won't. And so I will raise up the booth of David and rebuild it, and there will be an eternal Davidic king on the throne because that's what I promised. It's the same with the land. And if we're going to say, well, wait a minute, but the land part is immaterial, I would argue now we're starting to do some exegetical gymnastics. Like, okay, well, the Davidic part, yeah, that's real. Like, that really happened in the material realm, but not the land part. God is going to abandon the material world he made. And this is just a metaphorical way, a metaphorical way of speaking of heaven, the immaterial realm. My question to that would be, is that how the Jews understood it? And does that 
actually make sense of the whole context if you're going to, in the same breath, say, well, but he did restore the Davidic dynasty. He really did do that. Now you, you get, you're starting to get into some difficulties there. I tell you what, for time's sake, I'm going to skip Hosea 2, but you can write this down if you want to look at this one. It's the same points in Hosea 2, verses 16 to 23, where you'll see again this promise of restored land. I want to skip this one because the next one to me is very important. I'd rather look at this one. So go to Ezekiel 36. <clears throat> Ezekiel 36. And again, we're asking this question. What is the worldview of the Hebrew Scriptures? What is the story that they're telling about what God is going to do about sin and everything it has affected? Well, look at Ezekiel 36. And notice how God wants Himself to be identified in this passage. So look at verses 33 to 36. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited. And the waste places shall be rebuilt. And the land that was desolate shall be tilled. Instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I am Yahweh. I have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I am Yahweh, I have spoken, and I will do it. Now notice in this passage that the restoration of man, cleansing of iniquities in verse 33, the day that I cleanse you of your iniquities, my people, I'm also going to cleanse the land. I'm going to restore that which was desolate. I'm going to replant that which was desolate so that it will be like the Garden of Eden. Again, there we go again, getting back to those creation intentions, what God had deemed good before. Eden is thus God's paradigm. It's the paradigm for what God is working towards. And here, notice that God's way of describing himself is that I want you to know me. I am Yahweh. Here's how you're going to know who I am. That which was desolate, I restored. In fact, what's the very next chapter? If you got a heading there, you know. The Valley of the Dry Bones, where God takes what was dead and brings it back to life. That's how he's going to be known. Now we know that, we, we get that for resurrection. We typically just have not applied that concept to the material world. Which is what this passage helps us to see, at least from the Hebrew scriptures. Again, setting aside whether the New Testament scriptures are going to change this. But at least in the Hebrew Scriptures, the story that they are telling is that God is going to redeem everything He has made. Everything that has been cursed, everything that has been affected by sin is going to be cleansed. He's going to cleanse man of his iniquities. He's also going to cleanse the land from its desolation. He's going to restore it and bring it back to life. And then finally, you don't have to turn here because I have this one on the screen, but this cosmic focus then comes out explicitly in Isaiah. And this is where Peter quotes from in 2 Peter 3.13. When Isaiah, speaking by the Holy Spirit, speaking for God, says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Isaiah will repeat this in Isaiah 66 verse 22. In fact, there God says, The new heavens and new earth shall remain before me. So what we're seeing by this is that, again, this big picture story, the Hebrew scriptures are telling us, here's what God intended. This is why creation exists. This is why the physical, material world exists and why human beings exist. Genesis 1 and 2. Well, but that's beautiful. Why isn't the earth like that anymore? Genesis 3. What's God going to do about it? The rest of the Hebrew scriptures tell that story. And what we've seen are just some representative passages. What is God saying he's going to do about this whole world he's made, the whole cosmos? We've seen it includes restoration of mankind. We get that part. But notice how he almost always 
includes with that concept restoring the land. And that makes sense because in Genesis 1 and 2, that connection is there between uh, Adam and Eve and the land, between human beings and the land. And that connection is then consistent throughout the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures. We've just looked at some representative passages. There are all kinds of others that we could look at. And so the story so far, here's the story so far. This material world God has made is good. We should not have a view of this material world that, oh, this is evil and, and, and uh, this material world just needs to be destroyed. Hebrew scriptures don't teach that. That's not what they're, what they're saying. Material world is good. Now, it's been corrupted. Material world has been corrupted. So it's not the way God initially designed it. But here's what the Hebrew scriptures are saying. It's going to be renewed. Everything in the material world that has been affected by sin is going to be renewed. Now, somebody could be with me up to this point and say, okay, yeah, Nathan, fine. I understand that. In fact, I see everything you're saying there. But we all know that, okay, if this is how the Hebrews understood their scriptures, we all know that they had some misconceived conceptions about what God was going to do. For example, they expected a political ruler as Messiah, and then Jesus comes and is doing something totally different. So fine, the Hebrew scriptures may say this, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the New Testament scriptures aren't changing this worldview. Good question. That's fair. And that's the question that we need to then examine in the next class. Do Jesus and the New Testament authors abandon this expectation and instead give something new. Do Jesus, when Jesus comes on the scene, is he teaching, you Jews have expected God to restore the material world he's made. I'm here to tell you that's not what he's going to do. He's going to, uh, to scrap the material world he's made and your immaterial soul is just going to go to heaven. That's, that's really what God is going to do. That's what we have to ask. And for the next class, I give these verses... I encourage you to look at these beforehand because these are the verses we're going to look at to answer this question. Do Jesus and the New Testament authors abandon what we've just seen in the Hebrew Scriptures for now something different? We're going to look at these verses. Matthew 5, 5, Matthew 19, 28, Acts 3, 21, Romans 8, 18 to 25. We've already looked at 2 Peter in this class, but I still put it up there because it's such an important passage. And then Revelation 21, 1 through 5. And if you're going to look at these beforehand, think about it. Think about, okay, what I've seen in the Hebrew Scriptures is what Jesus or the Apostle, whoever's speaking the passage, are they overturning what the story of the Hebrew Scriptures is and introducing some new concept now? That, okay, well now it's just we're going to go to heaven and this material world is going to be abandoned to the effects of sin. That's what we're going to look at in the next class. And I'll return to that issue of God versus Satan. Again, that's just a shorthand, not saying that they're equal beings and there's a struggle there, but just a shorthand for how this topic so importantly bears on how we're viewing God's response to what Satan has done to the material world that he's made. And we're going to see that in these, in these passages. We'll talk about it more in the next class. I know this class, the next one, it's a lot of me talking because I don't have questions beforehand, but I really encourage you to look up those passages so that in the next class, you'll kind of thought about it before, maybe can come with some questions that we can address in the next class. Thank you so much for your attention this morning. God be with you this week. I'll see you next Sunday.